Well, good afternoon and welcome to another of our series of Webinar Wednesdays. I'm Kelly Bearden. I'm the director of the CSU Bakersfield Small Business Development Center and I'll be your host for today. And today we're going to be joined by three other very talented people. So let's get started with today's webinar in hiring strategies in a tight labor market. And it's really interesting uh, when we talked about this a few months ago and planned this, we had no idea that there would be some really interesting news that comes out on the front page of the Wall Street Journal a couple of weeks ago on this particular topic on how it affects firms with 20 employees or fewer. And if you look at this chart that we have on the US job market outlet, it shows that essentially the change of employment from the previous year for smaller firms. And if you notice, it has been dropping every year since 2012. And this is an interesting, in, in, interesting occurrence because it sh should be doing like the rest of the economy in the jobs market, where it should be progressing substantially the other direction. So we're interested in trying to figure out why this is the case and why small firms are not hiring like they used to in a tremendously boom economic condition and in an economy that is creating more jobs and more employees than at any time in history. So if you have an idea on why you think it might be, and we're going to be given a prize relatively soon, please go to our question and answer and put in your opinion on why that is occurring. And uh, we're going to try to find a prize for the best answer out there. So enter, enter often and, and we'll see what we can come up with if we can figure out why this is occurring. So today, uh, we're really fortunate to have two individuals that have excellent programs and really can tell you a lot of things you need to know if you're looking to reverse that trend and actually hire. So our first presenter is going to be Bill Stevenson. And Bill has uh, been the Director of Administration for the Employment Training Resource. Uh, he's been with the County of Kern for in excess of 25 years. He's been my go-to person when I've had a question uh, about how we can actually find some financial incentives and the on-the-job training program and other very valuable techniques that they have with America's Job Center and how to get that word across. So Bill, it's a pleasure having you here today. Thank you for joining us and welcome. Kelly, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, before I move forward, I'll do a couple little things of groundwork of explaining exactly what America's Job Center is. Uh, it is a collaboration of a number of different departments uh, and agencies, Employment Development Department, Department of Human Services, Department of Voc Rehab, Employers Training Resource, which is a federally funded job training and placement agency, Together, those agencies and others, the Bakersfield Adult School, Kern High School District, to name a few, make up what we call America's Job Center of California. AJCC, as we refer to ourselves, is a nationwide branding dictated by the federal government a couple years ago. Uh, for those of you out there who might be familiar with us, we used to be called the Career Services Center. In fact, we had a fun little jingle that Kelly used to like to sing, but uh, hopefully he'll do that for us a little bit later. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to go through hiring a tight labor market. I have a PowerPoint that you'll have a chance to see, and I want to talk about workforce services first. I am not a fan of reading word for word, dot for dot, what's on a slide. I'm going to hit the highlights and let you kind of fill in the blanks. What do we do? What do we do for workforce services? We offer the opportunity for employers to find screened applicants. We provide space for meetings, trainings, one-on-one -on -one or group interviews. Uh, we hire recruitment, we do recruitments. Uh, we can customize the recruitment. We have run recruitments for the medical field. Uh, we just did one for GetBus. We make the connection to small business services. Kelly mentioned our communication and work with each other. 
for a number of years. Uh, Kelly is part of our Workforce Development Board. Uh, but it's all about using the resources that are available to you, whether you're a large or small employer. We help secure qualified and pre-screen applicants. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll do a search of our clients and customers to find the right person for you. We can save a business, large or small, a great deal of money by being an extension of your HR department. If you have testing that you want to do, you can do it on site with us. We post and advertise job openings in our program called Cal Jobs. We also advertise various workshops and activity that you have. I think the key thing to remember is that when you look at the America's Job Center, we are a no fee service. For employers or job seekers, we do not charge in any capacity. Our program is fed, funded federally, and it gives us a great opportunity to give back to the community. Um, before I became a part of the administration, I spent about 20 years working in employer services. And it was very competitive back in the day when everybody had to get a certain number of job orders, everybody had to get so many placements, uh, and it was kind of a very competitive environment. And I watched this, I learned, everybody go after these large businesses. They wanted to get the big recruitments, the big hires. And I found that there was a portion we were missing and that was the small business. So what I did is I directed my efforts working with local small business. Uh, one years ago was Taylor Time on Chester Avenue got to know them very well, placed a couple people with them. Um, but I found that I could find a great deal of success working with small business and come to know what the business is looking for and become a friendly advocate for them. Um, so I understand the needs of small business and it was a very successful path for me when I was in employer services. First slide is some labor market information as of April, 2019. Labor force, about 385,000 people. Number of employed, about 353,000 people. Number of unemployed, about 32,200 people. I think there's that number of 32,000 is actually higher. Uh, that's oftentimes calculated by the number of people that are receiving some sort of financial aid, let's say unemployment insurance. Uh, they have a, a claim. Uh, there's a hidden job, job seeker market out there that people that have flat given up looking for work because you're discouraged. The unemployment in Kern County right now is about 8.4%. You can see on the, the scale, our fluctuation, much like small business, up and down, up and down, up and down, we're down to 8.4. Um, I always said if we got below 10%, I'd start growing hair. Uh, unfortunately, that has not come true. The unemployment rate has gone down. The hair growth, unfortunately, has not happened today. Labor force industries, what are some of our biggest employers? We have about 319,000 employers in Kern County. Total farmers, about 48,000 of that. Non-farmers, about 270,000. Mining, lodging, construction, manufacturing, financial services, professional and business services, a whole litany of different areas, leisure and hospitality, which is very big in Kern County. Our service delivery area, much like the SBDC, is all of Kern County. It's about 8,000 miles, including Inyo and Mono counties. So we are widespread as well. We have offices located in various locations throughout Kern County. Who are some of the top employers? Well, we have the Air Force Command, Kern Community College District, Northrum, the wonderful company, Salex, Kern High School District, Grimway Farms, SPDC is just sponsoring it, but they're a big employer anyway because Kelly thinks big, and Grimway Farms. Those are just a few of our big ones. Uh, Kern County hires about 7,400 people. What are the occupations with the most job ads? Registered nurses will pretty much always be there. Um, my, I come from a small family from Buffalo, New York, and all the women in my family were nurses, which was great when I got hurt and my buddies got hurt, I could bring them home to get mended up. So I understand what it takes to be a registered nurse and the dedication and the need. Retail salesperson, even though Amazon and, and Walmart, the competition with retail is changing, they're still looking for retail salesperson. Even with all the automation, at some point it's still a face-to-face. -face. 
heavy in tractor trailer truck drivers, class A truck drivers. Uh, we have class A companies looking for up to 200 class A drivers. Um, if you're willing to start over the road, great opportunity. Employers Training Resource offers training at no fee for those individuals that are eligible. So if you're interested in becoming a class A truck driver, we have the outlet for you to do that. Aerospace engineers, customer service reps, first line supervisors of food prep and service workers, combined work, maintenance and repair workers, general social and human services. No cost financial aid. Now, how do we help a business, large and small? Our biggest asset to an employer is not only do we get to know your business, we know what you're looking for, is the screening of those proper applicants for your position. Secondly, we have some very enticing financial incentives. Let's say you find the right person, and oftentimes employers hire by the personality. Does the person's personality fit in with my workforce? Will they get along with me and others in my team? You may find that person that has the right personality, but they're lacking some of the skills you're looking for. This You're looking for a couple years of experience in a certain area, maybe they've got a year, or they're just somebody that needs some, some basic training. This is where one of our most successful programs comes into play, which is called on-the-job training. This is where we reimburse an employer 50% of that employee's wage while they're being trained to do the job. We have about an 82% success rate with OJTs, as we call it. What happens is, is we work with the employer, some basic paperwork, we're the government, I gotta be honest, there's contracts you have to sign, we have to get some basic information from you, but it's not all that bad once you get started. Um, and that person starts work and there's a training outline that is developed between the employer, us, and the employee. So the employee knows what they're gonna be trained in. The employer knows specifically what the training is gonna be like. And it leads to a very successful marriage because you get a chance to get a good employee, train them and offset your training costs. Some of our biggest OJT employers are listed on the slide. I think of note, 177 contracts have been written this year to the tune of over $549,000 that has put, put, put directly into employers, what I call the bottom line. PCL, Covenant Coffee Group, these are just a few that you see up in the slide that have used our OJTs. In that group of 177,000 are a number of small employees, a number of small employers, excuse me. Another advantage that we have is a worker opportunity tax credit. This is a federal tax, tax credit available for employers to utilize for individuals that are face some difficulties in life, uh, might be on some, poor, some form of public assistance. Federal tax credit initiative for employers to hire, train, and retain job seekers. Again, couple this with an OJT, savings for the employer. Federal bonding program. This is a program that we work with with pre-release inmates and recently convicted inmates that are paroled who are finding difficulty in finding employment. Let's be honest, it can be a little chancy to hire somebody that has kind of a checkered past. With the bonding program, it offers the employer more security to hire an individual. So this is a great program. It's no cost to the employer. And again, couple that with a work opportunity tax credit. Now we've got the bonding going on. We've got the OJT going on. We've done the recruitment for you. We help tell you to hire the people. We provide an interview room for, interview room for you. We've done testing for you, all on no fee. So, so far you're looking pretty good. Layoff aversion services and transitioning. And here's the other thing that we offer. Rapid response, as we call it. Unfortunately, businesses are gonna run into difficulty. They're gonna to have to downsize. They're gonna to have to close their doors, unfortunately. We have two portions of, of our rapid response. One is a layoff aversion. If you're a business that's experiencing a downturn, contact us before you to do any layoffs or anything of that nature or any closures so that we can come in and take a look at what's going on in your business and maybe we can help you turn that around. 
Again, that's at no fee. We have experts, our business services experts are very skilled at looking at what's going on with your business and what we can do to help. Rapid response for people that do get laid off is somebody who has been displaced from a job or a homemaker that has to re-enter the workforce uh, due to losing the primary income through divorce, death, layoff, whatever it may be. So layoff aversion is very popular. Employee services and benefits. Again, this is no cost to the employees or employers. Reemployment services. I'm sorry, I lost my spot there. I apologize. Career counseling and job search assistance, resume preparation. What are we doing to prepare the workforce for you? So when you say I want to interview Bill Stevenson, Bill Stevenson has been through some career counseling. Bill Stevenson has an updated resume. Bill Stevenson has practices interview techniques. Bill Stevenson knows how to dress properly for the interview. Bill Stevenson knows not to bring his friends with him. Bill Stevenson knows not to have any uh, excessive jewelry on or uh, wear extra cologne or wear jeans or shorts on a hot summer day. Apprenticeships and internships and social media. This is another way that social media is very prevalent in our society, good or bad. It's a way of the world. Uh, it is an opportunity for us to uh, get apprenticeships, which uh, we're going to hear about in a few minutes. They're going to give you an opportunity to talk about how an apprenticeship can help in your business. Uh, we use them ourselves at Employer Training Resource to great success. And internships are another way uh, to get people involved with the labor force and have a little bit more structure in, in their training. Social media, many opportunities. You've got Facebook, you've got LinkedIn. There's a number of different ways that you can advertise your position. Um, my advice is you do all of those. Get your name, get your face out there. Uh, utilize the America's Job Center and our staff to get your name and your face out there. But it's a multi-pronged approach to finding the right people you're looking for. 65% are source new hires through social media in the past year. That's a very high number. 57% of companies hired new employees who were found on LinkedIn. 87% of HR professionals said it was important for job seekers to be on LinkedIn. So we also teach our customers how to get involved with social media as well. That concludes my presentation, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. I'll turn it back to your Grand Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Bearden. And again, everybody have a great day and call us if you have any questions. Thanks, Bill. Uh, some great programs. I, I don't understand why more people don't take advantage of all the great programs at America's Job Center. So thank you for delivering that message to us today. And we appreciate it. Now, after uh, I introduce our next presenter, um, we're going to take questions and answers. So feel free to hit your question tab and to put in there any questions that you have that you maybe have about America's Job Center or that about our next, our next presenter. And that's a perfectly good segue into our next presenter. Um, oh, also, if you want to complete our survey that we sent to you, please do that and we can send you the slides that are uh, from today's presentation presentation to help you maybe with any other uh, materials, any other questions that you have and contact information for uh, the individual speaking today. Well, uh, Mr. Stevenson did say something that at the SPDC, we are quite the employer and we do hire a lot of employees. Uh, lately that comes in the comes in the line of student interns from the School of Business and Public Administration at CSUB. We have found that our interns, our young and talented interns are energetic and work very well with our seasoned core of 15 or 16 senior level consultants that provide the one-on-one -on -one consulting free of charge here at the SBDC. So to learn more about you hiring interns rather than uh, just the SBDC and a number of other businesses around. Uh, we have the opportunity now to hear from Dr. Norma Rodriguez. 
And uh, Norma completed her BA, as you see, or MA, and PhD in political science at the University of Washington. So she was a, a Husky. Uh, a lot of her work that she does now focuses, I will paraphrase and do this quickly since you can read her outstanding credentials and background. Um, I like the part where she actually held the faculty position in the Department of Political Science at California State University, Chico, one of our sister CSU campuses of the California State University system, and of course, my alma mater, where she taught classes that primarily centered on the politics of race and ethnicity in the United States. Norma, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us, and take it away, please. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you for having me here and for inviting me to speak on um, the opportunities that business owners have to hire an intern through CSUB in general, but also in particular through the CSUB School of Business and Public Administration. Okay, let's start off with, I'm going to go through the processes um, and just offer some questions that I think help employers guide their thoughts about the kind of the thoughts that you need to consider in creating an internship. This will hopefully be useful to especially those of you who have never hired an intern before. So let's start with um, thinking about who's going to be your site supervisor. This is going to be the first thing that's going to be critical to um, hopefully ensuring that you've got a successful experience for both the student that you hire and for you as the employer and thinking about knowing up front who it is that's going to be responsible for providing that student orientation and for providing their supervision throughout their working um, there with you. And an in, through an internship, you're going to want to offer about 10 to 20 hours a week of the internship experience for the student during the semester, be it in the fall or in the spring term. Um, during the summer, if you end up hiring a student for that period, the student is eligible to work up to full time, assuming they are during a summer course or anything. Uh, what we want to do is ensure that there's a minimal amount of hours that can be attained by the student to try to ensure that they're getting a good set of experiences that they can include on their resume, but also in some cases, while at CSUB students are not required to register for an internship course, enroll in an internship course while they're in an internship, in some cases a student might want to get that credit because they need some elective hours. And so uh, if they are in a course, there's gonna be a minimum number of internship hours that they have to complete, and that usually comes to about 100. And so. We like to say that if a student during a 15 week semester can work for 10 weeks of the semester, hopefully they're working for at least 10 hours each of those weeks. Next, uh, it's good to think about in advance of actually creating the internship, what it is that you want the intern to be prepared to do. And specifically, what are going to be the duties and responsibilities of the intern once you bring them on board with your business? Is there a particular project that you would like for them to complete? In many cases, that's what spurs a business owner to seek out uh, an intern for just a um, specified period of time instead of hiring someone on, on a more permanent basis. Um, if there's a particular project that you're looking to get done that hasn't uh, you haven't been able to complete yourself, this might be a good uh, reason to hire an intern. Or even if there is a regular ongoing set of tasks that are not going addressed currently that you would like an intern to complete, think about what it is that you'd like them to do up front so that you can have a clear understanding before you move forward in the process. And then in addition to that, think about what it is, the what skills it is that you want the student to come in with that to help make them successful in completing the duties that you've identified for them. Um, in addition to that, you might want to think about what major or course of study it is that they're pursuing. And if there are any experiences in better employment related uh, that you believe are necessary for the intern to successfully complete the duties that you've identified for them in this role. Uh, and also think about what are the criteria that you're going to use 
to determine if one applicant is more competitive than the next when trying to decide which one to hire. Um, think about the skills as it relates to the tasks that you're going, that you identified for them to complete. And when it comes to experience, something to keep in mind is that many students do not have a lot of work experience. And so if you identify that you want someone who has at least one year of office related experience, it might be a little more challenging to get a good pool of applicants in that kind of situation. And so consider if in fact, it might be the skills that you're looking for, someone who has the capability to complete the tasks that you're asking, rather than someone who has experience in completing those tasks already. And in terms of uh, specific skill sets that students in the School of Business and Public Administration offer, I've outlined for you here all of the concentrations and majors that our students pursue within our school at CSUB. If we think about accounting and think about uh, what it is that you would like to have a student come and do for you at your business, you can think about in terms of general accounting procedures or bookkeeping if you'd like someone to come in to do some bookkeeping services for you. Ag business. These are students who are going to have an understanding of the fundamentals of ag related business development, including perhaps planning, marketing, management, all ag related. Um, those students who are pursuing a major in economics, they are typically going to be more analytically minded and data oriented. And so if you have a project that might be related to data, then that might be something that's going to appeal to a student who's majoring in economics. Environmental resource management is a major that we offer at CSUB. And those are students who are going to have an understanding of natural resources and environmental safety. So if you find that your business has a need for that, this might be a good fit for you in thinking about students with particular skill sets that you're looking for. Finance is uh, sometimes a popular major here. And those are students who have experience performing financial analyses, budgeting, uh, looking at projections for a business, and then you've got those who are majoring in what we call general business administration, and those are students who are going to have, um, have had exposure to a collection of all of these up here. Healthcare management is a concentration that is available as well for businesses that provide a health uh, care oriented service to their clients. Human resource management, we've got our standard HR kinds of uh, skill sets that are learned by students who pursue this area of study. And these are students who could assist you with recruitment and hiring needs, considering benefits and orientation packets that you might want to create for your current set of employees. That could be a project that an HR management student could help you with. And then we've got those students who are studying management, and these are students who would have strong skill sets in being able to oversee projects and have problem solving skills that they use in being able to conduct that kind of work. Marketing majors. These are students uh, more recently who are going to be focused on social media kinds of projects and other kinds of promotional uh, projects that you might have a need for. They're going to be those students who are typically more creative and have strong interpersonal skills. And so if you have a need for that within your business, that would be a good project for uh, an intern. Small business management students are those who have um, perhaps an understanding of the nuances needed to succeed in small business and help to provide you support in that area. Students who are studying public policy administration, on the other hand, are uh, they are exposed to in their coursework details on information and data management, as well as uh, coursework on contract management and budgeting. And then finally, there we have students who major in supply chain logistics. And those are students who are typically going to be more technically oriented and who evaluate 
how it is that processes in a business can be improved with a focus on, um, on cost accounting as it comes to improvements. So now that you have an idea for what it is that you want the intern to do for you and what skill sets it is that you're going to look for in order um, to find a, a good fit for the projects that you want them to complete. You want to think about the physical aspects in terms of where the intern will work. And in some cases, I had an employer who spoke with me and said, you know, I cannot move on this until I have figured it out in my at my, at my workspace where it is that this intern is physically going to exist. And so that's something that you want to think about up front. What is going to be a good workspace that's going to be effective in terms of the student being able to conduct the work that you want them to do and that isn't going to uh, interfere with the work that's already being conducted there at your place of business. What kind of orientation to the organization will the intern receive? You want to make sure that the intern knows about and has a very clear understanding about the business and the work that you do and the clients who you serve. Um, this is something that you've created from the ground up that is really important to you and you want the intern to have an understanding of the significance of that. And, um, to know clearly what it is that you do and why it's important who it is that you serve. Um, and make sure that uh, they understand what it is that you mean. And then consider the kinds of policies and workplace procedures that will need to be clarified for them. Uh, it, this can be as basic as what is the appropriate start time, what's the appropriate end time, it can be, uh, nowadays it can be, if you have a policy for personal phone use at work, make sure that the intern is very clear about what that is. Um, who it is that the intern will contact if they're running late or are sick. Um, make sure that, that they're clear about what it is that they need to do in each of those circumstances. Don't um, go into it presuming any uh, minimum set of knowledge. I was in a role previously at another university where I hired a student to work with the staff that I was supervising and the student had never worked in an office setting before and they were sharing a workspace together and the student decided that the, sh the chair that he was using was, wasn't as comfortable as the one that the staff person had and when the staff person walked away went and switched the chairs. <laughs> and thought that was an appropriate thing to do. And so the staff person came to me and said, you're not going to believe what happened. And so then I was in a situation of realizing this student had never worked in an office before and maybe or maybe not does not know that that's inappropriate. And so I had to have a conversation with them about that. So don't go into when you hire an intern, don't go into it assuming a minimum set of knowledge. Then as the next step to this, logically, what steps will the supervisor take to guide the intern? You want to make sure that you know exactly what it is that you um, are, are, are doing and thinking about as you bring on a student to come and work with you. And so how well, one thing that we want to do is to ensure that students are exposed to um, perhaps a variety of experiences and variety of, of projects when they are employed with you and that they aren't doing uh, and are not restricted to simply working on what might be less substantive tasks. And so we want to make sure that they're um, being exposed to things that are going to potentially make them more competitive for a job once they graduate and go on the job market. And to think about who it it is and, and the supervisor ensuring that, that everyone knows and is clear about who it is it's going to provide feedback to the intern. It's only through that feedback that students are going to learn and grow and become enriched in this whole experience. So ensure that they're receiving that feedback regularly. And then think about um, what kind of training the intern might be required to receive in order to develop the appropriate skills that they're going to need to produce the 
the level of work that you expect from them. Um, do they need a specialized set of skills in order to complete the task that you've identified? If so, then consider where um, they might be able to get that. And then we want the students to grow from the experience. We want them to understand that it's more than just a job and it's more than simply hours that they are putting in. It's about development and it's about them being able to see that they've actually walked away with an enhanced set of skills that they didn't have previously that are going to take them to their next experience. And so consider what are the goals and objectives that need to be clarified with the intern before the internship begins. Again, um, not presuming any previous knowledge on their part, just be upfront with them. And then what steps need to be taken in order to ensure the intern will receive broad exposure to the organization. If there's opportunity for them to go beyond what is the scope of their job on paper and maybe uh, take on or, or can make a contribution to another project that you might have going on. And um, if there's an opportunity that the intern might have to attend a networking event on your behalf and uh, potentially learn about the role that networking plays in, um, in, in creating opportunities for them in Bakersfield and outside the region. So finally, once you have a, a solid understanding of all of this, then you can think about actually writing the ad. And it's going to be the same kind of process that you have for writing any other job ad, where you think about the organization's mission and goals, um, ensuring that you highlight what your business seeks to accomplish and who it is that, uh, that you serve as a business outlining the intern's responsibilities and the tasks or projects that they're going to complete, describing the skills that will be developed during the internship. That's a good way if you include, um, I think, skill development and specifically what those might be, that's a good way to attract applicants, attract the students to actually apply to your position. And then list the required qualifications in terms of those skills, an education level, if you're looking for a senior versus a sophomore, a minimum GPA that you might be interested in, or a major. And then consider the number of hours that will be required per week um, during the semester, uh, really thinking about if there's any flexibility with an applicant's academic schedule, is are you going to be okay if the student has uh, courses during a particular time of the day or if there are fixed hours that they must attend. You'll also want to make sure that your ad states the rate of pay that the intern will receive and to specify how it is that the intern should apply. If you have an applicant tracking system that you use for applicants uh, at your, your business or if they should simply send their resume and a brief email to you and attach their resume in that email. And then advertise the internship. Once you have your ad written and if you're seeking an intern specifically through the School of Business and Public Administration, then you can send the uh, ad to me. And here's my information here, my email and phone number and our website address. And then what happens is once I receive the details from you regarding um, the ad and how it is that students can apply, I send out a weekly uh, e-newsletter to the students with current opportunities available to them and other career-related events that they should be aware of. And I'll include your ad in that newsletter and encourage them to apply and then hopefully you get lots of applicants from the School of Business and Public Administration and you have a successful intern who you hire. There we go. Wow, thank you. That's a lot of information, Dr. Rodriguez. And a lot of very valuable information. It's, it's funny here at the SPDC, people, some of our businesses will come in and they'll say, well, gee, I need, I need to get an intern. I need to get some help because we don't do much on social media. And oftentimes they feel that just because they're hiring a young person that they're gonna know how to use social media, social media appropriately for a business rather than for personal use. And that's where we really try to vet them through 
the School of Business and Public Administration, maybe taking a couple of classes in marketing and social media and so forth. So fantastic information. Both Dr. Rodriguez and Mr. Stevenson are available here for questions. So get your questions in. I'm gonna add one more, one more little program since I have a minute or two, and then we'll get to your questions. Um, another program, another resource that we've really kind of utilized here at the SBDC through a few other groups is the Employment Training Panel of the State of California. And ETP is a employee training program that's paid for out of your actual uh, payroll taxes and every employer in the state of California to the tune of 1%, one-tenth of 1%. So on your quarterly EDD employment tax form, you are actually wondering, hey, what's this one-tenth of 1% I'm paying? And that's what it is. So larger companies have really been uh, really good at taking advantage of this program to the intent that it was intended for. But smaller businesses don't know about it and they don't use it as frequently. At the SBDC, we've had clients over the last year or so that have literally, um, we've actually got about a quarter of a million dollars in their hands to help them do customized training, to help them do some safety and other training that's needed. I know I joke here at the SBDC that we believe in a safety third policy here. But in an industrial setting and oftentimes uh, a more of a commercial setting, safety is excruciating important. So there's a lot of programs that are out there and the employee, employer training panel and their programs are administered locally through, the, uh, through KCCD, the Kern Community College District. There's some manufacturing firms that have a contract. Again, as Bill mentioned, uh, this is a government program, so expect forms and expect contract and expect results and perhaps expect some disappointment along the lines, but there is, there is the opportunity for you to get customized training for free. So keep that in mind. You can contact us. I see some questions are rolling in right now. And for the question and answer session, I'm going to turn this over to Elizabeth Hamlin who is our producer of today's webinar and our assistant director here at the SBDC. So Elizabeth, question and answer time. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much, Mr. Stevenson and Dr. Rodriguez for joining us today and presenting this awesome webinar. So we have some questions coming in and please submit any more questions you might have to the Q&A box. So, uh, one of the questions we had was uh, for, for the WOTC, how does slash new hire qualify? How could you have a work opportunity tax credit? Uh, how, do, how do you use that candidate qualify? The candidate would qualify based upon certain barriers that they're facing. Uh, it, you would work with one of our program business services individuals to help you establish eligibility. It's something that can be determined at the time of hire or during the interview process. But one of our staff would have to guide you through that process. It's very simple. Wonderful. So we had a question from a viewer in Sonora, and they wanted to know, uh, where do I find the America's Job Center resources for their area? I know the answer to that. The answer to that would be Motherload Job Training, which is their version yes. of ETR here in Kern County. So Motherload Job Training, which is America's Job Center in Sonora. The other way you can find any America's Job Center is look up the local employment development office. EDD is a required partner in all the AJCCs. So if you can find the address for your employment development department, you're going to find the AJCC. Or just call Kelly directly, right? Can you do that, Kelly? No. No? Oh, well, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. And um, I think this one question is for you as well, Mr. Stevenson, is do you have a draftsman? 
I'm not. You have a what? A draftsman. I'm. I'm. Or oh, if we have an employer looking for a draftsman. Um. That's what it sounds like. Maybe. Um, maybe contact. That's a job opportunity. Give them my email address, Bill S at kerncounty.com. Send me the information. I'll be glad to do a search with employer services and see if we have any address. I'm not sure that we do, but we'll do a search for a database, see what we've got. Wonderful. All right. So this next question is for Dr. Rodriguez. So what would constitute a less substantive task? A less substantive task is typically going to be something that we are putting off ourselves and are stacking off onto the required desk somewhere and usually involves filing or something of that nature, something we don't want to do ourselves. And that's why we hire someone to come in and complete those tasks. And it makes perfect sense that an intern is going to do those kinds of things. We just want to make sure that in addition to those, that an intern might be able to do other things for an employer that might require you know, more skills or an enhanced skill set uh, that will hopefully develop the student in some way. Wonderful. So that's a, it's very important because I know none of us love to do paperwork. <laughs> We can't just hire someone to do the tasks we do not enjoy. Um, so he mentioned that students, interns are able to work in the summer full time. Uh, there are other breaks throughout the year. Are they able to work more maybe during winter or spring break? Yeah, they would be eligible to work uh, longer during winter and spring breaks. And um, it could become a bit more complex if the student is enrolled in an internship course or trying to enroll in an internship course. Just want to make sure that the student is able to count those hours toward the completion of the internship course uh, that they need. Okay, so this is a question we get a lot. Um, can I hire an intern with to not pay them. So they get to have some work experience and I get an employee out of the deal. Is this possible? If you are a company, a for-profit company, then the answer to that question is no, you cannot. If a company is seeking to employ an intern, then the intern according to federal regulations should be paid for the work that they're doing. And it's only in the case of a nonprofit organization that a, a student can go and complete an internship experience that contributes toward their learning because typically they're enrolled in a course when they're uh, at a non or nonprofit internship experience. And so they're learning and it's counting toward their credit. But when it's a business that is employing the intern, then the intern is expected to be paid. All right. So is it possible that I hire an intern and I enjoy that intern? Can I hire them in a permanent position while they're still in school? Absolutely. Yes. And so a student, assuming that the coursework that a student still needs to satisfy before graduation is available outside of the work period that they would um, be employed in with you, then they are eligible to work for you up to full time and then complete their studies outside of that and still graduate. That's wonderful. All right, we have another question. Do I get a free t-shirt if I hire an, an intern? <laughs> that one made me laugh. <laughs> Not within the BPA budget, unfortunately. <laughs> Maybe uh, Kelly will offer one through the SBDC. I have my free t-shirt. And I guess that's the last question. When you get a free t-shirt question at the end, that's gonna be the last one. So it looks like we're at the end of our time slot or time for today. I would like to thank Bill Stevenson from America's Job Center, Norma Rodriguez from the School of Business and Public Administration at CSUB, and of course our producer, Elizabeth Hamlin today. 
for these fine individuals. Join us on, July, on June the 12th for Tactics of Social Media. We'll be back with the webinar Wednesday then. Have a great and profitable business day. I'm Kelly Beard and have a great day. Bye-bye now.